This is the Royal Report. Good evening and welcome to the Royal Report. I'm Caroline DeRusso. And it's been a big week, even by generous royal family standards. Here's what's coming up on the show. Omid Scobie's controversial book, Endgame, has sent shockwaves across the globe, but can the claims be trusted? Reports that legal action could be on the cards over royal rumours in the book. Russell Myers joins us from London to discuss. And what does this all mean for the Sussexes' already damaged relations with the royal family? We will give you the latest. But before we get to all of that, let's get across the latest in this royal race row. Here's the original claim which kicked off this smouldering bin fire. So we have in tandem the conversation of he won't be given security, he's not going to be given a title, and also concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. What? After the initial allegations were made, Harry said that he wouldn't ever tell who made the comment the subject of the allegations. That conversation <laughs> I'm never going to share. And then he backtracked on that. In the Oprah interview, you accused members of your family of racism. You don't even... We didn't. Well, of... The British press said that. Right. I... Did, did Meghan ever mention that they were racist? She said there were troubling comments about... Yeah, oh, there, there was skin concern colour. about his skin colour. Right. Last week on the show, we brought you allegations from Scobie's book that it was, in fact, two royals who surmised about what Archie's skin colour may be. And while the names didn't appear in the English version of the book, it somehow appeared in the Dutch version. Here it is in black and white. On page 128, it says, in those private letters, an identity was confirmed. Charles. Well, I'm going to show it to you. It is just here. Later in the book, on page 334, it states that Meghan and Charles also spoke in their letters about unconscious bias within the family after it was revealed that the King and Princess of Wales participated in such conversations about Archie. Rumours are swirling as you'd expect, but author Scobie remains adamant his version of the book never named names. Journalists across Fleet Street know, have known those names for a long time. We've all followed a certain code of conduct. I had never submitted a book that had their names in it. A claim the Dutch translator Saskia Peters appears to reject. As a translator, I translate what is in front of me. The names of the royals were there in black and white. I did not add them. What happened here is anyone's guess and it's unlikely we're going to receive a straight story. In any event, if you provide information to a third party, you lose control over it, how it's presented and when. These allegations have reverberated across the mainstream media and in circumstances where the naming has become actually more prominent than the original allegations. But like any scandalous royal story, there's going to be a myriad of consequences, not least any hope that there could be a reconciliation between the Sussexes and the royal family. Joining us now is News Corp columnist Louise Roberts and entertainment reporter for news.com.au, Bronte Coy. Ladies, welcome back. Now, Louise, there's been plenty of back and forth about how these names made it to the publication, mm -hmm. but it's caused quite a stir, hasn't it? Absolutely. I mean, what a week. Um, Endgame, whose Endgame are we talking about? Are we talking about Meghan and Harry, perhaps? Because really now they have to stand up and say, yes, it was Kate and Charles, or no, it was not Kate and Charles. To let it fester in this way is absolutely appalling. And the whole um, alleged racism thing has been hanging over the House of Windsor for the last three years. And the ins and outs, and he said, she said, and you see the contradictory behaviour you've outlined at the top of the show there, Caro, is, is just, it's obscene. So they really have to now bail out their family and say what the truth actually was. And let's not forget these are allegations. They've never been proven. And we know the Queen herself said that recollections may vary. So now it's back on them. They have to actually say what happened and who said it and what was actually said, if it was said. I think that's right. And Bronte, this has all become bigger than the story itself, hasn't it? 
Absolutely. And I couldn't agree more than with Lou there, which is that I, I do feel that Harry and Meghan are in a position now where they really need to say something on the record about what they meant, who it was, all of that, because they're in a bit of a tight spot now. But uh, this has become the big story. I mean, we had these excerpts last week from the book. We did know, uh, Omid, had, Omid Scobie had said prior to the book's release that it was going to be going over these um, significant events. So we knew it would rehash old wounds. But of course, the leaking of the names in however manner this has actually happened has now become the story to the point where, of course, um, the author has had to go on the defensive and give interviews um, denying responsibility for it. This has become the major story. It's really overshadowed any other anecdotes that were in the book. It also has uh, uh, unfortunately overshadowed, really, the King's big moment at the Climate Action Summit this week, which where he delivered a speech. And, of course, everyone's just talking about the fact that the royals were named uh, and that's the focus. So I don't think anyone's really come off well in this situation other than perhaps uh, the people that are profiting from the book sales just because what a week of publicity. But, yeah, it's it's been an absolute mess. It has. And, Bronte, staying with you, th those comments by the translator, I mean, that then makes the situation for everyone else quite difficult, doesn't it? Absolutely. It's really quickly become a he said, she said situation. And as you said before, I don't really know that we're going to find out exactly what happened because already it's quite vague and anything that we have heard about it. So the translator has said, and bearing in mind, she's someone who's done this job for many years. She has referenced the fact that she has translated many, many books, uh, never, ever experiencing an issue like this before. And she said the words were there in black and white in front of her. So that's that's what she said and what she's put out there. And she said, she translated exactly what she was given. Of course, we heard at the top of the show there that the author has said it was never in any draft, any edition that he submitted. I don't know where the truth sits in all of this. I don't know how this could happen. I, it, but as I said, it's, it's a very big mess. And I do believe that we are unlikely to find out exactly how this has occurred. All we know is that something is going to happen as this all keeps unfolding between the royal family and Harry and Meghan and the author and uh, the shambles. <laughs> I feel like everyone's duck for cover. Well, almost everyone. Louise, Piers Morgan didn't hold back naming names. Here's what he had to say. I'm going to tell you the names of the two senior royals who are named in that Dutch version of the book. Because, frankly, if Dutch people wandering into a bookshop can pick it up and see these names, then you, British people here, who actually pay for the British royal family, you're entitled to know too. I don't believe any racist comments were ever made by any of the royal family. And until there is actual evidence of those comments being made, I will never believe it. The royals who are named in this book are King Charles and Catherine, Princess of Wales. Louise, it was inevitable, though, wasn't it? I mean, the names had been published. They, they were in uh, that version of the book. It was becoming a very poorly kept secret. It was only a matter of time before it was openly reported, right? That's right. And look, Piers was bold and he was blistering, but he was also essential in what he said. It really puts it back onto the Sussexes to say, if this has ended up in a book and you're making these allegations years ago without actually naming them at the time, we're all on tenterhooks waiting to hear who it was, now is the time to come to the party and say truth or it's false. Just, you know, you really have to speak up now to what Bronte said earlier as well. So, and I think Piers made some excellent points around, you know, people all over the world took the comments um, about racism and other things at face value. And, you know, grievances were sort of given this sort of veneer of truth and it was like my truth versus the truth. So, you know, it's absolutely bl blistering what he said, but, you know, it had to be said. A, a line had to be drawn and thrown back into the court of the Sussexes. And I think this is the point, right, Bronte? There is now, now that we know who the names are, there becomes this question about the credibility or the sources behind the allegations. Yeah, absolutely. Look, with all these royal books, of course, uh, the issue is that most of the um, insiders that are sharing information, and often they are top level, but they're unnamed sources. So we don't really have any way of verifying which claims are, are most likely to be accurate or, or where they sit or which side, which camp they've come from. And before this book was even published, uh, Omid Scobie was quite a well-known figure and quite divisive also following the release of Finding Freedom, his first book, which really told Harry and Meghan's story before they started telling it themselves. 
So a criticism that has followed him is that he's very sympathetic to their side, uh, that he does often, it has been said that he provides just that side without a lot of balance. And so, again, when you're reading this book and you're looking at it from that perspective, uh, you, you know, you, you do have to take that in as a factor. And, you know, when we're talking about, this is the issue, we're talking about such big accusations that have lingered around for so long. Uh, we don't know where his source came from with this. He suggests in the book that he has, you know, eight to ten people uh, in the room when all these really important conversations happen. But I think this stems largely from a letter that was sent between Meghan and Charles, allegedly. So in that case, you have to imagine that there'd be significantly less people looking at it. So again, you wonder who the sources are. And, and this is the problem with royal books often. It's their unnamed sources. We don't know where they've come from. It's, it is very hard to to pin down the accuracy of what we're reading yeah that's that's fair now louise there was always going to be blowback on the sussexes what's been the reaction well, the reaction almost is that the pair of them belong on Big Brother. I mean, they've been accused of having a very sort of low rent, um, bad strategy to publicity, not befitting a royal status or even someone who's left the firm in recent years as well. And, you know, they had such a golden opportunity to build um, a royal court, as it were, in Hollywood itself. And they've just blown it up. They've blown it up with this insistence on attacking their family, ostracising their children from their cousins by virtue of that and all the attacks on the family. So it, it's a very, very strange um, strategy, even though we, we're, we're being told that Megan's got new representation and, you know, new people guiding her and what to do. But, you know, they're almost like reality TV stars. And I don't say that in a favourable way at all. <laughs> <laughs> and Louise, there are broader, um, obviously, consequences for the relationship with the rest of the family. There are a few barbs in Endgame for Queen Camilla, um, but query whether they'll actually stick the way they were intended to stick. Well, absolutely. I mean, Camilla is Teflon. This is the, the queen of never complain, never explain, which I think really endeared her to the late queen as well. But in the book, um, apparently Camilla rolls her eyes when someone mentions veganism or sort of gender identity issues. And um, there's other sort of comments she makes around, you know, it woke them, thinks it's, you know, a load of rubbish, which that's not going to hurt her reputation. That's going to garner a whole new generation of fans who love her for her straightforward <laughs> attitude as well. So um, I think, you know, like I said, Camilla can't really put a foot wrong in this situation. Absolutely. But Bronte, the more dramas that seem to engulf the Sussexes, the more it appears to isolate them from existing circles. Tell us about the society wedding they apparently weren't invited to. Yeah, this is a big story that kind of came in the middle of this massive bookstorm that's happening this week, and it's quite sad. So uh, uh, the Duke of Westminster, who is a long-time childhood friend of both Harry and Williams and is understood to be actually Archie, Harry's son, of course, uh, his godfather, he's getting married next June. It's going to be the society wedding of the year. The king and queen are expected to be there. Prince William and Kate are expected to be there. But it's understood that he and his uh, fiance and his family have decided uh, not to invite Harry and Meghan and that he'd actually wanted to, but he realised that things were just so strained between the family they couldn't put the royals in in a position that they may feel uncomfortable so that's a really sad uh, situation to be in it really just again paints a picture of how far things have fallen for Harry and Meghan you know this is one of his oldest friends and he does just have a few key friends left by many reports so yeah the fact that he's, he's now having to be excluded because it would be so awkward you can imagine for the bride and groom it's a really tough situation it's hard enough when you're not royal or famous or royal Jason planning a wedding with all the guests, you know, with this one. Where are you seating everyone if Harry and Meghan are there? So, yeah, it's a, it's a really sad situation, but really does just highlight uh, how far out of it now, that how far out of the loop that Harry and Meghan are, but Harry especially. And, Louise, I've only got about 30 seconds left. Anything to add to that? Well, to see his friendship group sort of, you know, crumble like this must be heartbreaking for Harry as well because although he's, you know, launching broadsides at his own family, he's probably still hoping that his mates in the background will always choose him over his brother, but clearly that's not happening at all. He's being ostracised by his own friendship group, which is quite tragic because he obviously doesn't have any real friends probably in America. They're all with him or attracted to him because of the royal connection, but it's um, time for a bit of a rethink on who his mates are and maybe rebonding with his family, although that seems very unlikely at this point.
I think that's right. Louise Roberts, Bronte Coy, thank you for joining us. Now, coming up next, will the royal family take legal action over Endgame? Russell Myers joins us from London to give us the latest. Welcome back to the show. Joining us now is Royal Editor for the Daily Mirror, Russell Myers. Russell, it has been quite a week. Uh, a lot has been said about uh, the allegations, but I'm more interested in the why. Why are these things said in the first place? Because once you tell someone, you lose control of that information. Well, absolutely. Hi, Caroline. I mean, that's exactly the question, isn't it? Why on earth are we in this position? And certainly, how do, on earth do we get out of it? And that is the big question I suppose the royal family could be asking themselves and, indeed, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, because it was first in 2021. I mean, can you believe we're still talking about this issue? And I suppose the royal family thought perhaps it had been put to bed, perhaps there was the green shoots of a new relationship with Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, and yet uh, here we are with the two royals being named this week. Um, and I think that uh, when you look at the, the situation, people will think it's uh, wholly unfair about how this uh, whole episode has come about. And Russell, you've uh, published a piece within the last few hours about the implications of this book uh, on Harry and Meghan. What, what did the Sussexes do at this point in your view? Well, I think they're in a difficult situation because, you know, they perhaps were, were trying to, certainly Prince Harry, trying to uh, garner a new relationship with his father. We know that the call that he had with him on his birthday, the video call or video message that they sent with the children uh, for, the, for uh, the king's birthday. And so you know, he is possibly thinking that there is um, you know, the green shoots of this new relationship about to be burgeoning. However, I think this puts them in a, a very difficult position indeed, because all of this mess, this whole saga, started when Meghan Markle made those allegations to Oprah Winfrey. And uh, regardless of them changing their story, whether it was the allegations of racism or unconscious bias, uh, you know, that was the, uh, the, the, the foundation for, for where we find ourselves today. Now, the rest of the royal family appear to be getting on with core business this week. Um, that seems to be the standard approach, correct? Well, very much so. I mean, it's straight out the, the royal handbook, isn't it? You know, business as usual, keep calm and carry on. And we're going to see that this week. We're going to see the diplomatic corpse reception at Buckingham Palace. It's a, a cemented date in the diary for the royals. And uh, a glittering ceremony. We're going to see, obviously, the king and queen hosting it, but the prince and princess of Wales will be there as well with other members of the royal family. And very much, you know, this uh, this diktat from, from the palace um, this keep calm and carry on, I suppose, is uh, is being filtered down throughout all of the royal family. And uh, and then on Friday, we're going to see uh, the Carol concert, Kate's Carol concert, which has been a great success over the last couple of years. Um, and uh, that will take place at Westminster Abbey. And again, a huge success, huge focus for the royal family in these troubling times. Now, there's also been some talk about a potential legal action um, by the royal family. Do you think that's likely or advisable in a public relations sense? Well, it's difficult because it isn't unprecedented, but we certainly had instances in the past, uh, but they are far and few between where the royal family have decided to, to take legal action. Um, I can think of when the, the Queen backed Brexit, there was a newspaper that was taken to court, uh, topless photos of, the, uh, of Kate Middleton when uh, William and Kate took a French magazine to court as well and won. Um, this is quite a, a difficult situation for them to decide. Should they you know, go with public opinion, which has been overwhelmingly sympathetic, or do they need to make a stand on this book? Um, uh, I wouldn't be surprised either way. I mean, that is potentially sitting on the fence, but I, I could see a situation where they do take legal action. It is very, very serious claims that we've got here. Um, but they, they may decide to, to, to take their foot off the gas, not rush into any decision and uh, and wait it out and see see what happens. Now this blow up has been called the royal racism row, um, but even the head of the racial uh, a former head of racial equality there in Britain considers the allegations to be nonsense. As a society, do you think we jump to convenient conclusions on this sort of thing too quickly and easily? Well, I'm not sure, really. I mean, obviously, the, the allegations were made by Meghan Markle herself. We can only, you know, take her word for it of how offended she was by certain comments that she alleges were made. Prince Harry backed her up in that Oprah Winfrey interview. But they have changed 
their story. I mean, you know, uh, Prince Harry was saying we didn't say racism, we were blaming it on the British press. But when you're talking of conversations in such a nature, I think it's very, very hard to, to get out of the, the sort of race row concept. And so even by saying unconscious bias, I know that is a distinction that Harry and Meghan have both made. But, you know, these are very, very serious allegations um, and conversations that it, one, one family may say are completely normal and another family may say it's not. So I suppose it's only the family and the people who are offended who, who really know what happened on that day and certainly um, and, uh, and how taken aback they were. Now on to other things. King Charles made a speech at COP28 this week. Here's what he had to say. Unless we rapidly repair and restore nature's unique economy based on harmony and balance, which is our ultimate sustainer, our own economy and survivability will be in peril. Russell, how was his speech received? Was it well received? And how did this kind of play against the backdrop of the current family dramas back home? Well, it was certainly his main focus. I mean, he didn't get to go to the last COP when Liz Truss, you know, the Prime Minister who was only uh, in, in power for a few days in the UK. She pretty much banned him from going, didn't think it was appropriate. Uh, Charles would have wanted to be at the last COP and invited once again to speak in front of world leaders. Very, very important to him. You know, he's been a campaigner on the uh, environment and climate change for the last 50 years. Very, very well respected in that sense. And I think that, you know, listening to his words, world leaders were, were gathered on mass to, to listen to his, uh, his keynote speech there. And listen, he is back in the UK now. He's taking the weekend off, but uh, it will be back to business, I suppose, and um, thinking about with the, with the lawyers and the senior aides about how best to tackle this situation, because uh, it will be a renewed focus this coming week. And William and Kate were also on uh, official royal business this week with the Royal Variety performance. Can you run us through this event and its purpose? Well, it's great. I mean, it's at the Royal Albert Hall. It's a glittering ceremony. It happens every year. It's a sort of a, the best of show business that the Britain and uh, has to offer, and lots of guests from the, around the world. I think Kylie has definitely performed there uh, down the years. It's certainly one of the, uh, the the big calendar moments, not only for the royal family, but for, for Britain as well. And it gives a chance for the royals to let their hair down, celebrate, you know, the best of the entertainment industry. And I'm sure, um, you know, looking back on that, they'll be looking forward to, uh, to the Carol concert on Friday. Russell Myers, as always, an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks, Carol. Now, just before we go, it's been a big year for Taylor Swift and her dominance on the global music scene. Anyway, it's reported this week that Prince William is an avowed Swifty. He shared a stage with Taylor Swift and Bon Jovi back in 2013. And who let the cat out of the bag on this one? Well, none other than Rolling Stones royalty, Ronnie Wood. And that's the show for tonight. Thank you for joining us. Up next is Newsnight. Good night and we'll see you next week.